Max Highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. A warm welcome to the Highlights show today, which starts off on a lighter note. And I mean that quite literally. Here's what's coming up. Shine a light, a whole new dimension in modern interior design. Done by hand, Mats Gustafsson's fashion illustrations hold their own against the camera. And Waste Not, Want Not, a Berlin startup is making designer furniture from Euro pallets. There are a lot of people in the world who suffer from seasonal affective disorder, which is the medical term for feeling depressed at certain times of the year. Research shows that light is very integral to our happiness, and a Berlin-based group of light designers have been working to defy their lack of light in the winter days. They've come up with some innovative ideas to keep Berliners smiling as the long winter draws in. It's autumn in Germany. The nights are drawing in, and the sun becomes a rare sight. When you wake up and it's dull and grey outside and there's no sun, it darkens your mood too. There's plenty of sun where I come from. In Germany there isn't even enough sun for me in summer, so I miss it all year. I work out a lot, and I want to do something for my appearance so I'll feel better. I might go to the solarium, so I'll get some sun. The designers in the Lichträumer office in Berlin know how important light is for people. The group has already had a number of projects. They've illuminated everything from stairwells to entire office buildings. Mirko Muralka is a lighting designer. He specializes in making interior light as close to daylight as possible. We wake up when it gets light and we go to bed when it gets dark. Sunlight is our reference point and you can't improve on that. You can only simulate it very closely. There are many ways to use modern lighting elements. They can be found in swimming pools and in offices, in museums or doctor's surgeries. But new forms of lighting are also being used in private homes as well. Economical LED lighting means there's more space for light than ever before. You can change colors several times and let them run through automatically. You can also create an image and use light to set the scene to make the space always look different. And that's always something pleasant. Berlin's Charité Hospital is carrying out research on the positive effect light has on people. A small intensive care unit has received new lighting. Two four-bed rooms have been redesigned to offer patients more privacy and comfort. Illuminated ceilings are supposed to promote healing. Sunrise and sundown gives us a day-night rhythm that makes us sleep better at night. There are green elements in the room, you can see them up here. That shade is conducive to feeling protected. The space has been designed architecturally to make it seem like a living room rather than that storage area feeling you get in other IC units. Illuminated ceilings are supposed to relax and entertain patients. They can play with the system's elements to change the colors, look through treetops or gaze at moving clouds. He's expecting a cold, loud, intensive care unit room. Then he wakes up and sees how friendly it is, that there's light above and it's not so loud. I think patients enjoy it. Businesses are also trying to shed new light on themselves. A shopping center in Berlin's Hellersdorf district is being refurbished and equipped with an LED lit ceiling. Licht is a very strong Light is a major driver of feelings of well-being in both private and public spaces. Given that, using lighting technologies in an interesting and intelligent way can influence passers-by's feelings of well-being and contribute positively to their willingness to buy. Ceilings like these cost about 100 euros per square meter. The price increases in proportion to their complexity. Besides looking good, they keep energy costs down too. Two good reasons to lift your mood and come into the light during the autumn and winter seasons. 
Harper, one item of clothing that's particularly popular in the winter months is jeans. The material is durable, hard wearing and made to be worn again and again. But there comes a time when you just want a new pair. What might be old and rugged to you, though, is treasure for British artist Ian Berry. And the more ripped, faded or thin, the better. He has no plans to wear them, though, just to use them for his artworks. But one of his pictures will probably cost you more than you'll ever spend on jeans in your entire life. London, as you've never seen it before. Piccadilly Circus Tube Station. Or the view from Primrose Hill on the north side of Regent's Park. At first glance, Ian Berry's works look like paintings. But look again. They're made from denim, the fabric used for jeans. Some of those works are currently on show at London's Cato Gallery. It's kind of cool. Um, you know, it's um, you know, there's the rebel basis, but I mean, really it's been the kind of go-to item of clothing for maybe 50, 60 years. So it's gone through so many generations. And I think everybody, or I would say like 90, 95% of the population has a connection with jeans. Everyone's got a favourite pair of jeans. The exhibition includes 31 of his jeans collages. The 29-year-old used urban scenes for his subjects. They're not well-known sites, but they are typical of the city they're in. Like this collage of a New York restaurant made of countless bits of denim. It's because of the... Uh, the little, little tiny bits that he just thinks about and also finding that piece of denim to make it work. He doesn't just put any old piece of denim in, he finds a very, very specific bit. I know sometimes he says he spends as much time looking for that piece of denim as making that piece of denim for the picture. Wherever he is, Barry is always on the lookout for new material. A British-born artist who normally lives and works in Sweden, he loves spending time in Camden Market while in London. Its second-hand shops are a veritable treasure trove. Like this, you know, <laughs> to most it looks like it's all ripped. I mean, yeah, that's great for grass, whereas that's like, you know, probably what, that's exactly what I use for the subway car. I actually look more now for what to use in work than what to wear. In my own personal wardrobe, I've got about two pairs of jeans and um, they, often, they just get sacrificed if I need a shade. Barry became an artist by accident. After graduating from graphic design school, he worked in advertising. Seven years ago, he decided to try his hand at art. He cuts and assembles his collages in his studio near the Swedish city of Malmö. It can take him up to five weeks to finish a work. Something which is really hard to translate in like online, video, you know, print my work. It, you know, some people think it's all very flat or photoshopped. I mean, I've had friends that have seen this work for the last seven, eight years, and they've, they've come into a gallery suddenly and said, I had no idea it was like this. I thought it was, you did it in Photoshop and it was flat and printed. As subjects, Berry frequently uses hidden places that he discovers while strolling about the city. One is this typical English pub in a London side street. The pub is um, iconic, but it's not, I wouldn't say it's overdone. Like, you know, there's some, there's some things which are overdone as subjects. And I feel that the London pub or the English pub is like a real essence of urban living, but also community, especially the pub behind. You know, you get locals going in and there's a place where people all join together. And images of pubs dominate this latest show. Most of the works were already sold before the event even opened. Depending on the effort that went into making them, they sold for prices between 1,000 and 15,000 euros. By putting them with an everyday fabric and an everyday kind of scene, people now look at it differently and kind of reevaluate. Oh, yeah, maybe shops are closing down, like I've got the shop fronts. Uh, maybe like a the newsstand, they're all closing down in America. So they will relook at it and think, oh, it is such a nice part of the fabric of the urban environment. Ian Berry doesn't always wear jeans. Besides, he says, most of his trousers wear out pretty fast anyway.
and the exhibition will run till the 11th of December there. Now, the Italian island of Sicily is the largest island in the Mediterranean and it's home to Europe's largest volcano as well. The volcano is very prominent in the city of Catania, which lies at the foot of Mount Edna. And the lava was previously used as a welcome resource for construction or for making wine and chocolate. Mount Etna is the largest volcano in Europe. Right now, it's active again. Someone who is well acquainted with Etna is Ranger Luca Ferlito. Every day, Ferlito drives through the ash and lava fields to help lost tourists. He'll also be the first on the scene if Etna erupts. When I first got the chance to work on the volcano, and feel it breathe. It nearly bowled me over. Of course, I really respect the volcano. All his life, Ferlito has been fascinated by Etna's landscape. His family comes from this region of Sicily. When I was still little, when I was just two, my father took me there on an excursion. That image of the volcano erupting had shaped my life. During Etna's last major eruption in 1669, streams of lava flooded into nearby Catania. Today, you can still see what it was like in the basement of the city's university. We're here inside Catania's Benedictine Monastery. Only today, the monastery is a university. Here you see what was then the monastery's kitchen. It was built on the lava that flowed down from Etna in 1669. A lot of the monastery and its surrounding fields were destroyed then. The eruption nearly destroyed the city, but it left behind the materials for rebuilding it as well. Today, streets, houses, and even the city's emblem, an elephant, are made from lava stone. Nearby, you can even find out what Etna tastes like. In Modica, people have always made chocolate using the stone. 80-year-old Luigi Baglieri is the last maestro of this local tradition. First, you heated the chocolate, and after it melted, you stirred it, and then you poured it onto the stone. These days, machines have largely replaced lava stone. The local specialty is chocolate made with cocoa, sugar, vanilla, and cinnamon. It's cooked at only 45 degrees, so it has an intense flavor. The local wine is also famed for its intense taste. Many vineyards here are nestled on the slopes of Etna. The Cambria family owns one of them. Mount Etna makes this region a unique, special wine-growing area. It's really what gives the whole region its character. Here the wines have a very distinct character. They are fresh because of the altitude at which they're grown. And the mineral-rich soil makes the volcanic wines very strong tasting. Mariangela Cambria says her family has been running the Cottanera vineyard since 1970. She's part of the second generation. The winery employs 25 people and produces wines like Nerello Mascalese and Merlot. Wine is about land, passion and love. It's not just a red liquid that you pour in a glass. It's also a history of the people who believed in the properties of the region's soil and still do. After the sun sets on Etna, Giovanni Trimboli's day begins. His wine store offers Sicilian food with a twist. This food is prepared with local wines. One of the typical dishes we prepare is cauliflower marinated in red wine. We prepare it carefully, then cook it and then serve it with another Etna red wine. Because the wine's fragrance and taste is unique, it can't be compared to any other wine on earth. For Sicilians, Etna isn't just Europe's biggest volcano. The mountain shapes almost everyone's life here. 
For years, fashion designers began developing their ideas by literally putting pen to paper. It used to be the only way they could show the latest trends. That was until photography came into play. Although there is now less fashion illustration being done, it's still very prominent in the industry. And one of the top names in the game is Mats Gustafsson from Sweden. With just a few deft brushstrokes, Mats Gustafsson creates illustrations simply oozing grace and elegance. From his 1997 work for the designer Yoji Yamamoto to his current campaign for Dior. His repertoire is as extensive as it is impressive. The biggest element in all my work is that I am obsessed with beauty. I don't use um, really um, facial expressions. It's sort of a, just a... Uh, uh, an abstraction of a, of a person, and 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 I think that has been my way of of um, um, finding a niche where I can exist and where I can express myself and where I can express fashion. So I can simplify, I can exaggerate, I can abstract. Gustafsson started out his career in Stockholm, but he's lived in New York since 1980. The train set designer still has a studio in the Swedish capital and he regularly retreats here to draw. He needs peace and quiet when embarking on a new project and that often means withdrawing from the hustle and bustle of regular city life. My technique is, is quite simple. It's usually about um, works on paper and, and, and I, have, uh, I always start with sketches, you know, um, pencil drawings on, on paper and the medium I'm, I'm mostly working in is, is watercolour. And with watercolour especially, it's also a, a, um, an element of chance, you know, it's not always what I control. It. He first came to attention when British Vogue published pictures of his in 1978. A year later, the US edition of the magazine followed suit. Since then, Gustafsson's drawings have appeared in all the most important international fashion magazines. Fashion illustration, I think, has to somehow, of course, uh, reflect fashion and, and be part of the, the time and the zeitgeist, if you want, or and I think I always uh, loved fashion before I even knew there was such a thing as fashion. Gustafsson sees fashion through an artist's eyes. His illustrations feature regularly in exhibitions worldwide. The Milers Groten Museum near Stockholm recently hosted a show of 90 works covering the past 30 years. In February, they'll go on display in Gothenburg. The illustrations or the art of Mas Gustafsson, I think it is very Scandinavian art. He uses few colors, he uses forms and shapes, and he does it in a very minimalistic way. And when he, he uses so few elements, they become even stronger. A hundred years ago, painted illustrations were the only medium available for showing the latest trends. This one from 1912 is a case in point. Later in the 1950s, the fashion world discovered photography. Watercolours and sketches are becoming rarer, but photographs can't displace or replace them entirely. I think the reason why illustration still is so important in the fashion industry is because it can focus on certain things, whereas the camera more or less just de depicts everything and uh, the illustrations can enhance and make it stronger and make us capture just that, what, what, what the designer wanted to show. So the illustrator really helps the designer. Södermalm is Stockholm's creative district. Gustafsson often draws inspiration here. He loves watching people and gaining a sense of their individual styles. I, I usually say that the inspiration is not something that's just around in the air. It's, it's actually uh, also 
comes to you when you are involved in, 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 a, in the process. I think, of course, the, f the inspiration is fashion itself. Fashions change, but Matt Gustafsson's illustrations go some way to making them timeless, at least on paper. Now, I'm sure you've all seen goods being carted around the world, on TV if not in person. Many of the crates used are called Euro pallets like these and they're made with pine wood. Whilst this is extremely solid, they do sometimes break. They're then disposed of and that is where a Berlin-based upcycling company called Kimidori comes into play. They make the pallets into design and furniture like this chair and their ideas are continually evolving. Unwanted Euro pallets, recycled and put to use by a new Berlin startup. 35 year old Sebastian Novakovsky joined some friends and set up Kimadori in January. They make sustainable items of furniture from recycled wood that has a history. Palettenholz erzählt eine Geschichte. Das heißt, Pallet wood tells a story. Each pallet has carried its own load. It's been on an incredible journey for hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of kilometers. It still bears the traces of its journey. You see it on each piece, wherever it comes from. Each pallet tells its own story. Kimidori buys up the pallets from special suppliers. There are an estimated 500 million of them in the world, used mainly for transporting goods. They're often discarded once they're broken or reach a certain age. Alternatively, the wood is recycled, cleaned, sanded down, and turned into furniture. The chairs, tables, chests of drawers, even lamps are sold online in different designs and colors. Each item is simply designed but unique and costs between 200 and 600 euros. You can practically read where they were made from the markings, where they first set eyes on the world as such. And you can still see it on our furniture. There are pallets from Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Austria and Germany. Some of the new furniture is made in a small workshop in Berlin. Mandy Slavitsky needs between three and eight hours to fashion a piece of furniture, depending on how complicated the design is. The really nice thing about Euro pallets is that I don't have to work down to the millimeter in the way that I do when I'm making a kitchen. I can work in a rougher, more rustic way. The dimensions are predetermined by the slats, and that makes a nice change. Kimidori currently has eight different designs in its range. And there are five new ones on the way. At the moment, they only exist as paper models. Product designer Danielle Becker has been nominated in the category of Best Newcomer for the 2014 German Design Awards. When Sebastian first approached me, I had a certain distance to the product. But I soon realized that pallets would still give me many of the same possibilities I have with conventional fresh wood. So I tried not to allow myself to be too put off by this used element. In order to finance the new designs, the furniture startup has launched a crowdfunding campaign. Supporters can make a financial pledge online. Once the company has raised the money it needs, it plans to start production. If everything goes to plan, the Kimidori team will soon have a dozen plus designs made from old Euro pallets. 
Well, that is all we have time for today. But do join us again tomorrow when we'll kickstart a brand new week of lifestyle news from around Europe. For now, though, thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves and goodbye.